So as I said, I will be studying mathematical model, but it's still good to keep something like some concrete example in mind. So here's one uh, an illustration of one network that you could think of. Uh, so it's a social network, uh, computerized social network as maintained by a very big uh, American IT company. It's a bit older already from 2010. So in this network, the vertices are users and they put in their location and there's a, a link between two users if they, uh, if they declare friendship with each other. One advantage of this network is that somehow all the data is publicly available and in an anonymized way, it's, it's even amenable to research. So uh, this is like, I mean, very, very big networks with like a complicated structure, that's the thing I have in mind. And I don't want to study this network in particular. So I mean, the computer science lit literature is full of uh, statistical studies towards this and other particular networks. As mathematicians, we rather strive to find a uniform, uniform patterns which appear in networks and, and to see how we can put this into models. And I would like to particularly to advertise one model that uh, I think is quite good for, for this type of complex networks. So this uniform patterns which exhibit in many of these networks, uh, I, I'll briefly describe them here and later on I will give a more formal description of them. So for most, many of these networks, no matter whether it's uh, a model I've shown, other social networks, financial networks, biological networks, they really I mean, come from different fields of science. And uh, there are these, uh, a number of properties uh, are these following four. So the first is that so-called small world. Small world means that if you take two vertices, which can be like yeah, either arbitrary or, or far away, then if you want to get from the one to the other one through the network, then it's very short if you count the number of edges that you need to traverse. Somehow there are some very long range edges and if, if you can make clever use of them to, in order to, to go from, from the one to the other. So that's what goes under this name small world. The next is scale free. So not scale free would mean somehow that there's, uh, that it's a homogeneous network in the sense that people have the number of, of edges vertices have is more or less the same. And scale free means the opposite, it's not the same. It's very unfair. There are some vertices with like lots of links and others which have like only very few. So to be more precise, uh, we want that these so-called degree distribution follows the power law. Then the third kind of implicitly assumes that uh, this network is embedded in some sort of space and in this underlying space, then uh, if you're close in the underlying space, then also you have a much higher probability to be connected than if you're further away. So, um, but somehow you, you can also see that without this underlying space somehow, then you would just say, say clustering. So that in, uh, would mean somehow that the graph has many triangles. Yeah, like if you're linked with two people, then the higher probability that they're linked with each other as well. And the fourth one uh, is, yeah, I call that hierarchies. Uh, that somehow means that if, you, if you're an important person, in the sense that you have like many edges, then you're, you're with high probability you're linked to other important person because somehow Maybe if you're like an institute director, then you're most probably linked to other institute directors. This type of thinking is behind this. So before we go into the model, here's, yeah, I already mentioned somehow that we, it's sometimes useful to think of, of an underlying space in which the network is embedded. That can, be a region, that can be a geographical space, as in the first picture I've shown you, but it by no means link, limited to that. For example, here's a network closer to home which the resolution is not so good, so you can hardly see anything except one name in the middle. So that's a mathematics collaboration graph. And so the vertices are mathematicians, and you put an edge between two mathematicians if they have co-authored a paper together. And so uh, the Gene Dunn is, uh, he's not in academia, funnily. He's in, uh, working as a quantum insurance company. Here's a block, and uh, there he uh, visualized this data, but also what he did, he, he um, let the community detection algorithm run on this graph. So somehow he found the strongly uh, 
connected communities, and, and these are the colors in this picture. You see the blue color, the green. And so uh, what I want to say with this is somehow it might make sense if you want to embed it into a space that the space is not, can, for example, it's not so useful to take the actual location of where the person is located, but it would be, in this sense, it would be rather more useful to, to encode somehow, say, the mathematical fields. Because, like most of you, probably much more, uh, much more probably will co a paper together with another probabilist than with, say, someone from algebraic number theory. Well, there are exceptions, of course, but for, for many of this is maybe true. So, yeah, so we th should think of space as being, like, can be very high dimensional and complex also, not only necessarily R2 or R3. So I'm, I'm working towards a model and I would like to go on with several steps. So the, this is the first step and, and somehow I think that somehow going through these steps will, will help to, uh, to, to understand how, where the model comes from. So that first model I, I would like to try out is long range percolation. That's an older model already started in the in the 80s, it was, and, and then later on. So I, I take as an underlying space Z to the D, so hypercubic lattice, and I connect any two vertices, X and Y, with the probability written there. It's one minus E to the minus lambda over X minus Y to norm to the power alpha. So first of all, this one minus E to the minus, where Y is that? So in fact, we are interested in particular for the, I mean, it, it's really interesting, I mean, to, to, to look at what happens what, if X and Y are far away from each other. And then typically if, uh, the thing in the brackets is, is very small. So, so we should think of this P of X, Y is about lambda times one over X minus Y to the alpha. The reason why we put there one minus E to the minus is somehow that when you're coming close together, then it's, uh, well, on this basis, it, it doesn't really matter, but then you, you sometimes need to cut off to, so that you do not exceed one, because you can, probabilities cannot be more than one, and this is like a neat way to, to avoid that. So there are two parameters, lambda and alpha. So lambda, I call this a percolation parameter, so what lambda actually steers is the density of bonds. You know, so somehow the more, the higher lambda, the more edges there are and the less lambda, the less edges there are. And what alpha does, alpha uh, characterizes how, l how long these edges are typically are. If alpha is very large, then this would mean that it's very, very expensive to form a very large bond. So most bonds that we see will typically be very short. Yeah? Then we would like have a short range model. And if alpha is getting smaller, then it's getting easier and easier to form this long range bonds and so somehow then most bonds will be long range. Yeah? So that, that really characterizes that. Therefore, I write it characterizes the geometry of the resulting network. So, and then it's known that if and only if D is greater than alpha, the graph is locally finite. Otherwise, if alpha is getting too small, then somehow it's too easy to, to form like long range bonds because there are like many possible partners out there, then you will almost surely have uh, infinitely many if, uh, edges out of every single vertex. Uh, if D is greater than three times the minimum of alpha and two, and some technical condition, which I summarize on this word spread out, then we have some kind of mean field behavior, then somehow everything is nicely under control. That's some older work of, of mine with Hofstadt and Sakai, but that's not the, not, not the uh, route that we want to go now. We, we are more interested now in the smaller alphas. So now I come to these characteristics that I've mentioned earlier. So the, first of all, scale free. I said scale free. I'm in particular that the degrees, so degree is the number of edges that go out from a vertex, that this is a, it's, it's a random variable, that this has a power law. And yeah, so that means somehow that the probability that this exceeds S is behaving something like S to the minus gamma, and so I don't want to be too precise on what it means, say, you can multiply with some function that is regularly varying at infinity, for example. Secondly, it's small world, so now that we have an underlying space, we can, uh, I want to formulate small world in terms of the underlying space. So the underlying space is Euclidean space, and it just takes a two norm, and so if, 
and d of so so this uh, the absolute value between x and y that's somehow the under, the norm of the underlying space and d of x y is a graph distance so that is means the minimal number of edges I need to traverse to go from x to y and I call the model small world if this graph distance is at most log of the uh, of, of the Euclidean distance. Possib possibly it can also be some power, yeah? so locked to some power, that would also be fine. And then a, s a subclass of that is so-called ultra-small worlds, where it's even lock-lock. So we all know that lock-lock is a function that diverges to infinity, but divergence is so small that for all practical measures, it may safely be assumed to be, say, almost constant. So the bad news is that long-range percolations of satisfies neither of these properties. Yeah? It gives a very homogeneous y. So uh, there are long-range bonds, but somehow they don't, they're not organized enough. So we need to do something in order to, to organize them together. So that wouldn't work as a model as, uh, that I'm looking for. Here's the second candidate that goes uh, under the name norosh raitu model. It has been proposed by Norosh and Raitu. And uh, it's a particular form of, of a Chung Lu. A random graph. So their idea, so they, they uh, have no uh, embeddings, uh, no space in which they embed it. They just have n vertices, which I'm drawing here in a circle. And they put some a priori weights on the vertices. And in the weight, they already put a power law. So that's this, this weight, Wx, is a, the weight of, of the vertex x. And they already put in some, some power law here. So with that exponent, tau minus 1. And then you see that that's the probability that two point, two vertices x and y are connected. It's again 1 minus e to the minus. And now it's lambda times, and it's a product of the weights that goes in here. So somehow the higher the weight, the bigger the product, so the, the higher the chances that you make connections. And you can see from the simulation here that uh, this is indeed uh, what's going to happen. So y y there, there are red dots for the vertices, and the size of the red dots indicates how big the weight is. And so you see a very big uh, weight here, still a fairly big one here, and then very small weights here, and there are some, some little bigger ones here. And you see that indeed these are the vertices with the very high degrees. So we, we do have a power law in that model, and so we have a scale-free network. But somehow, there's no geometry in this model. All points are treated the same. In particular, this clustering will, will fail in this model. And the solution is now to, or in order to overcome this, we are putting these two models together, the long-range percolation and the norosh two model. And this will be our new model. So what we do, we again back on Euclidean space at D. And we assign to every vertex in, in, in space, we assign this IID weights with a certain power law with this exponent tau minus 1. And then we put the edge in between these two, like 1 minus e to the minus lambda. And now it's a, uh, the product of the weights divided by the Euclidean distance to the alpha. And again, so, so because these weights can be pretty large, and I don't want probability to be larger than 1, so this 1 minus e to the minus is a way to, to, to cut this off. So that's a product of wx, wy. So this is, uh, this is how you should, should think of it. And now we have the three parameters. Again, lambda controls the density of edges that we have in the model. The alpha characterizes how long bonds are typically are. And the tau minus 1 guarantees, uh, uh, the tau minus 1 steers, I mean, the, di the distribution of the whites. So if you think of tau as being very large, that would mean somehow it's very expensive to have a, ex a very high weight. So then for, for large tors, the, uh, there's not so much variance in between the, uh, the, in between the whites. So then somehow it's, they're very f extremely, f somehow it's extremely pricey to, to make like large weights. But if tor is getting smaller and smaller, then somehow you will have more and more of the excessively high weights, and they kind of will be, become hubs in the network. Yeah. So uh, tor somehow, uh, if, you, if you like, measures the fairness. Yeah. So the smaller tor, the, 
more unfair the way it's distributed. So now I would like to study this model in dependence of the three parameters. Yeah? So alpha again says how long the bonds are. So the tau minus one gives, controls the weights and the lambda controls uh, the, overall, uh, the overall edge density. So this model, yeah, so it goes under different names in different papers. Uh, it's not yet completely settled. Uh, in a paper by Dyfen, Van der Hofstadt, and Hochhiebstra from 2013, it was called scale free percolation, and to me, somehow, this name sounds the most fancy one, that's why I'm using it. In a uh, uh, 2015 paper by Depress, Hasra, and Wittrich, they call it uh, inhomogeneous long range percolation, which is also kind of a good name because it's an inhomogeneous random graph model combined with long range percolation. And Bringman, Koch, and Lenglev, that's a group of computer scientists from, from Zurich, they call it geometric inhomogeneous random graphs, which is abbreviated as JERK. Uh, and th that is in a, in a finite setting. So the second and third paper I should mention, they also they do the model in, in continuum space. So they have like a Poisson point process in continuum space. That's another possibility to do here, but somehow in terms of the properties that, that we can see in the model, it doesn't really play a role whether we are on the lattice or on the on a continuum space. So this is the model, and now properties. Now first, sorry, first simulations. So you see the Norwich Reiter model on the top left. Then on the, on the right, you see long range percolation. You see that there are some long range bonds, but they are not in, somehow they are kind of splattered evenly over the, over the space. And, and here you see uh, scale free percolation in its full beauty. So uh, again, the volume of the, of the red balls uh, indicates how, how big the weights are. And you see that the ones with the high weight also get like all the good connections and they, they reach really far whereas the small ones don't reach very far normally, except like, I mean, they find like a very strong partner to which they can connect to. <coughs> so the first thing to ask is the degree distribution, because uh, th that will tell us whether we are scale free or not. And the answer is yes, we are scale free in, yeah, in the right parameter regime. So on the top line, there's again the probability that two bonds are connected. So, how's this picture look li looking like? So this is tau, and this is alpha. And so, under point one, there is a regime where the graph is actually not locally finite. So all the degrees are infinite, and that's a regime where either the alpha is larger than d. Or, sorry, alpha, alpha smaller than d. So here, here you will have an, uh, a graph that's locally, if, uh, not locally finite. Or a new parameter called gamma, and gamma is the product of alpha and tau minus one divided by d. So that's a new parameter. If that one is less or equal than one, so this is something like the line, the gamma equal to one line. So this is a regime where the graph is not locally finite, yeah, if infinite degree. And otherwise, so in this part, we will have a power law, but it's not the original power law of the weights. So remember, the, the weights have this power law of the parameter tau minus one, and to really have to take the geometry into account, so the alpha now plays a role in this power law exponent. Yeah, so the, it is again a power law, but the exponent for the power law has changed due to the geometry in this way. So gamma is this new uh, parameter here. So, but, but, I mean, power law is enough to say the network is scale free. Good, because that's what's our aim. The next question is percolation. Is there a percolation phase transition? Somehow, if you play only with this parameter lambda, with the density of the bonds, uh, and I define the critical value for percolation in the usual way. So I say below lambda, so lambda c is the lambda, such that below lambda c, we do not have an infinite cluster, and above lambda c, we do have an infinite cluster, almost surely. And uh, again, it depends very much on the parameter. Now, 
uh, it says infant variance degree and finite variance degree. So the variance is not actually changing at this line gamma equal to one, but it's changing at another line gamma equal to two. Maybe I should write it like this. And that is for gamma equal to two. So this is a line which is drawn here. So in particular, there is a regime where lambda c is equal to zero, but it's still locally finite. And then there's a regime here. Let's say here's 2D, where below that, we have an, a real uh, phase transition in the sense that somehow below, uh, for, first, uh, for, for small lambda, it's not it's not percolating, but then there's a lambda c, and then if you, if you increase lambda even more, then there's an infinite parameter, uh, there's an infinite component. And up here, we are somehow in the picture that we know from nearest neighbor percolation. So for dimension d greater equal to two, we have normal phase transition, but for dimension equal to one, we do not have it anymore. We cannot have percolation in dimension equal to one, so that would be, mean lambda c is equal to infinity. So that's, uh, in, the, in, uh, in these papers. Now we come to distances. Distances are interesting, so we take two points, and somehow we, we want to make, we always look at this now under the conditional law that the two points are, say, both in the infinite component, and only look at the, the regime where we do have an infinite uh, component. And there now uh, the picture becomes more, more interesting. So first of all, there is a regime where the distance is at most two. Of course, it can be one. If the two points are directly connected, then the distance is one. But if you take any other distances, you will always find like a mean and joint friend, no matter like how, how far they are from apart. Then there's another regime where there is an upper bound, at least, which, uh, which is, can be more than two, but it's, it's still a finite number. Then here we have this ultra small world regime, so where we have log log of the Euclidean distance is an upper bound for the, for the graph distance. And in fact, I think the, the, the drawing is a bit older. So meanwhile, there are some new results also by Hofstadt and Komiati. So what they, they proved even the, the corresponding lower bound and even, even better. So you can, take, you can divide the graph distance by log log of the Euclidean distance and this quantity as x and y uh, the distance between x and y goes to infinity. This quantity converges in probability to, I think, two over the absolute value of log gamma minus one. So it's even, I mean, there's a very strong convergence. Then there's a regime where we have a small world, but it's not quite, uh, it's not ultra small. And then we are again here, up here, we are in the, in the regime in the, same, uh, in the same universality class of, of nearest neighbor percolation. Yeah. So somehow there, the, the long range bonds don't change the picture at all. So here is still, here it's a bit unclear like what, what the correct power is, but uh, otherwise the picture is fairly clear. So now we want, oh yeah, so if, um, maybe I say like, but some, something about this proof, because somehow you can explain it very well, like in one picture. So uh, th here's a proof. You take two points, and they might be very far away, but still in the picture they are, they are like, like these two points. These are my original points. And now the, the art is to find uh, first a box, and then you find annuli. And in each annulus, you, you look at the vertex with the highest degree. And somehow you, you want to make this annuli larger and larger, I mean thicker and thicker, so that you have more and more points available. And the more points you have available, the higher typically your maximal degree vertex is, because you have like more, more guys to pick the record from. And uh, then you, you try, so the only thing you can tune is somehow this, the radius of this, of this annuli. And so, so the, the art is to, to tune it in such a way that somehow, if you look at this, the maximal vertex, then the probability that, b that both points that you start with are connected to this maximal uh, vertex is uh, bounded uniformly from below, or at least well, uniformly is very strong and it works here, but non-summable would be enough, and then Borek can tell you gives you that one of them you must have success. And 
so on the one hand, you want to make the, the annuli very thick so that you have like more points to choose your record from so that the record tends to be higher. On the other hand, you don't want to make it too thick because somehow you need to, that's the distance you need to overcome in order to reach the other annuli. Yeah? So you don't want to make it too much. So you have to, to play a bit, but that, that works relatively nicely. So now I would like to come to more, more structural properties and that is somehow study a percolation cluster or study say a random graph in general through random walk properties. So a ran random walk means somehow we, we take a point in the cluster, so let's suppose the origin to, to fix one vertex is in the infinite cluster. And we, we start with a random walk in, at the origin and it, uh, the random walk goes in discrete time and at each time step he looks at the number of vertices, uh, sorry, it's, it's available edges from this vertex and he, if there are like seven edges and he chooses each of the seven of probability one over seven, say. Yeah, is it clear? So, so my impression was this morning, it's, it's the audience is a bit quiet, so I would invite you to interact if you like. <laughs> At least not, or I mean, shake your heads if you <laughs> don't agree. Um, so, if, uh, and we call the, the random walk recurrent if almost truly we return to the starting point, and otherwise it's called transient. Uh, transient means lost in space. Uh, that's, and so, uh, on the one hand, the properties of a graph kind of can be used to determine the properties of random walk on that graph. But we can also think of that in the other way around, somehow that if you understand the random, random walk properties on a graph, you have properties of that. Then this also infers properties of the graph itself. Yeah? So I really would like to see the things in correspondence and use the random walk property as like a property of the graph. So here's the results. Uh, that I have. So first of all, let's uh, explain the word undefined. So what, what is undefined? Why is it undefined here? Yes. Finite. Yes, it's not locally finite. So it doesn't make sense to, to, to define a random walk in sense. Thank you. Someone answered the question. <laughs> yeah, so we end this regime. So it doesn't make sense to speak of random walk. But then we see that there is a transient regime uh, which is here squeezed in between gamma 1 and gamma 2, and, and here squeezed in between alpha and, uh, uh, sorry, between d and 2d. And up here is a regime where, uh, where we are in dimension 1 and 2 recurrent, and uh, it's unknown in, uh, in dimension greater or equal to 3. And, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, I forgot to say that somehow, it, of course, scale-free percolation is linked very much with long-range percolation in the sense that one, uh, the, the one can dominate, uh, it dominates long-range percolation. So if, if we put some, some lower weight of, say, one on the vertices, so we, we request that all vertices have weight at least one, or say some positive constant, doesn't matter, then we can always compare, uh, we can always, then this mo model always dominates long-range percolation, which just have everywhere um, vertex weight one. So that means that we can infer uh, some of the results from long range percolation carry over to, uh, to scale free percolation. In particular, in these distances, all the upper bounds they carry over from, uh, from long range percolation, and the art, uh, the art was to, f to, uh, to find to matching lower bounds. So here it is, we are also in the same universality class of as uh, long range percolation until equal to 2. So, uh, so apart from that, that's the same picture that we've, uh, we see in long-range percolation as it worked out by my Munich colleague Noam Berger uh, something like 15 years ago. And, but somehow, still, I mean, there's some work to make sure that the uh, whites don't spoil the picture. But then when Tor is getting less, uh, less than 2, then it's really, uh, the whites really start to kick in and, and change the picture. So um, I would like now to zoom in on, on the proof of this transient in this regime up here and tell you how this is done. And somehow it's not only this proof is going like this, but it's really like a technique that works in this type of graphs in more, more general. And uh, I would like to explain you, yeah, I would like to explain you how, uh, how this is done. So again, the, the statement is up there. So if gamma is in between one and two, then the supercritical cluster is transient. That's what we want to prove. 
and uh, supercritical is somehow it means any cluster because lambda c was zero in that regime. So this proof goes in two steps. First of all, we, we proof it for lambda very large. And then in the second step, we kind of make a trick to, to go from the large value of lambda to the small value of lambda. But in order to, to carry out the trick, we have to make, uh, we have to build already some, some uh, something into it. And that is we allow a certain, uh, yeah, a certain fraction of the vertices. So fraction is epsilon. We remove a priori from the vertex and only work with the rest. So, so epsilon is a very small number. Uh, and so with probability epsilon, we, we, we kill like every vertex and the rest we paint green and we only work with the green stuff. And uh, I will later explain why we need that. And then for the remaining graph, we use a so-called multiscale on that. And uh, this roughly goes as follows. So we group these vertices into finite boxes. And then we call these boxes either good or bad, depending on like structural properties inside the box. And then in the next step, we go to, a, we group lots of these vertices into bigger vertices. And then again, we, we call them good or bad, according to the question, first, do we have enough of good smaller boxes? And second, do these good smaller boxes are interlinked with each other in a good way? That's kind of how the argument works. And then uh, this will apply transients if somehow the, the a fixed vertex, say the origin, is like, I mean, has positive chance to be like an only good box. So then, then, then we are done. So that's, and then somehow that works for lambda large. So that's a global picture. And now we zoom in on the details. So um, we fix this sequence of CN, DN, and UN. And now we start with zero stage boxes. And these are just the vertices. And uh, I mean, as long as the vertices are green, we, we always call them good. And then we. We group them into one stage boxes. So for that, we uh, make boxes like that. So that has at least have links D1. Okay. So D D1 is the side length. And this this new boxes, this one stage boxes, so this is uh, d1 to the d vertices, and we call them good if at least c1 of them are, are good. I mean, c, c, they contain, say, sufficiently many green vertices. And also, we, in every box, we always look at the weight of the largest box. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the weight of the largest vertex. So suppose, like, maybe this is the largest here, and this is the largest here, and this is the largest here. And we also want this largest vertex to have a weight which is sufficiently good. Otherwise, we say the box is bad and somehow, because the high weights will be necessary to, to bridge, like, I mean, the gap to, to the other points. And if weights are too small, then, then we, have, we are doomed to fail. And then from, from that on, we, we have, uh, we iterate this procedure. So the, if you have, uh, like, n minus one stage boxes, then we take like d n stage boxes by, by taking like d n of these n minus one stage, stage boxes, so that's d n, so it's really a big one. Then we want to have enough good of them. Yeah? At least c n of them must be good. Then in one of these, there's a, in one of the good ones, there's a vertex with, with weight at least little u n. And now it's a property that's a bit strange somehow that the, in these in the good n minus one stage boxes, <coughs> we take the n minus two dominant vertices. So these are the ones uh, which like at, at one stage smaller. So maybe it's best to look at this picture. So that's say maybe the, the end stage box, the green one. <coughs> Sorry. the green one, and then we have the red one are the good n minus one stage boxes. And there we look at the n minus 
two dominant vertices. So these are the largest vertices in the blue, in, in the in the n minus two stage boxes, and these should be all connected to each other. They should form a clique, yeah, so connected all to each other. And this is uh, a property which will be necessary somehow to control, to have sufficient connectivity uh, in order to get the transients finally. So here is uh, again an explanation of this in, in, in one dimension. So you see the sp space here on the bottom, it's one dimensional now. And on the vertical scale, you see the weights. And so uh, the higher the vertices are, the thicker they are, are drawn. So that uh, somehow, so that, that's like the thickest in the whole box. And you, maybe we, we should read it from, from bottom to the, uh, from top to bottom, sorry. So this is uh, like a good end stage box. It has at least one, yeah, so, so it, it consists of four n minus one stage boxes, yeah, because dn is four. So it consists of one, two, three, four. Then at least three of them are good. So fortunately, three of them are good. This, this means not good, the red dotted line, whereas the green solid line means good. Uh, one, one of the vertices must have weight exceeding uh, un. That's fine. And if you look at the, the biggest vertices in the n minus two good n minus two stage boxes, then they must all be linked with each other. Yeah. So that's what you see here, that they're all linked with each other. They're not linked with these ones, but that's, we don't care because somehow this box is anyway uh, bad. And then uh, we go on like this. This, for example, is also a good box. It has like one uh, one weight is, which is above here. It has at least two good boxes, and and, and at this level somehow these things form a clique. So that's the type of construction you're making. And here, yeah, to make the long thing short, here's here's a choice that apparently works. And somehow, I mean, the numbers have no meaning. It's more that somehow it, it shows you that it takes you some time to to get to the right answer. But somehow after some uh, after some some exercise, you, you, you hopefully come up with something. And in, in this case, I mean, that seems to be a choice that works. And uh, here you can see that we really tried a while until we, we get it. But okay, so that works. And so if, let's suppose ln is the probability, no, ln, of ln I meant not the probability, at the event that the n box containing the origin is good, then indeed uh, one can show that the probability that all ln events appear uh, is strictly positive, so that means that the origin is an only good box, so it has positive probability. And then finally you apply a, a, a lemma of Berger, who said that the graph which is generated in this way, which only contains of the good boxes, that indeed is, is a transient graph. If this, uh, under this condition, somehow, uh, the reciprocity of Cn must be uh, summable. So this lemma come, uh, comes from electrical network theory. So what, what's basically done is that uh, once you have, that, that's where you need this, this interconnectivity, uh, yeah, this click assumption, this third assumption, which looked a bit technical, but that's why it goes in. And it basically, if, uh, one can construct a flow from zero to infinity of which has only finite energy. So this one, this quantity here is an upper bound on the energy that's used for the flow, and that's why uh, how you have to obtain the transients. So that completes the, uh, the first part, and it just leaves me a little time also to say now. The second part, so now if you, we proved everything for, for large lambda, but now we want to get it to small lambda. How can we do this? And uh, well, the handle that we have are these little epsilon of vertices that we have not used so far. And the idea is to, to, couple, uh, to, co yeah, to compare two models, model one and model two. So let's say here, here are some vertices. Say, say here's V1 and here's more uh, vertex V2. And here are, I'm zooming out, meaning somehow that the vertices are very, very small. And I make boxes of side lengths n. Uh, okay. So please, let's 
square boxes. So this is something like now n times v1. We, yeah, we, we should think of like blowing blowing this up, and this down down there is n times v2. And again, as before, in every box we only consider the largest the, the vertex with the largest white. So suppose it's this one and this one and this one. So let's call this one. This is u1, and that is u2. So here in model 1, we, we operate with, with lambda 1, and lambda 1 is a very big lambda. And we want to compare it to the other model with lambda 2, and lambda 2 is very small. And so this is called coarse graining somehow. You zoom out, and instead of looking at, at the vertices itself, you look at, at big boxes. And, and these big boxes become your new vertices. But uh, so. We have this large box of settings then, and now we have this lemma, which, which gives us a comparison between these two models. It somehow says we have this one model where if here it's v, v1 is here and v1, v2 is there, then instead of that, we're looking at the uh, ui be the highest degree of this, should be nvi plus this, uh, plus this box of side links n. And then this is the original model. Somehow that's the probability that this link is present. And this probability provided, sorry, no, that's, that's the left. Uh, on, on the, oh, oh, okay, I apologize. So on, on, the to, on, on the top line of this uh, inequality, we are in model two somehow. That's, that's how we want to use it. That is the probability that u1 and u2 are linked by an edge. And this is dominated from below by the probability that actually v1 and v2 are, are, developed, uh, are combined by an edge. If we change the parameter, so, uh, so this is a parameter lambda and I mean, w is just the whites, but so we, have, we need to, to scale the lambda, uh, and th that is somehow the new, new lambda, and, and beta is arbitrary, so that goes once in the condition here, and then it goes here into the lambda. And we choose, yeah, so in order to apply it, we, we first choose the beta such that somehow uh, you, you, uh, you, you get up somehow the, the origin, uh, so instead of uh, from lambda two, you want to, to go to this coarse grain model, and so you, you take uh, you, you want the new lambda somehow to, to be good enough, so that, that this is really bigger than the original lambda one here that you have. Now, if you want to compare it, and then you choose this n so large that somehow the probability that uh, your, your maximal weight vertex is indeed sufficiently big, so that will be this one minus epsilon from the box, and then you use this lemma to uh, to compare compare the two, so if you look only at this model, and now you look only at the red vertices, only at the maximum vertices, and that already kind of is, uh, is a, forms a graph that is transient. So that is a subgraph of the graph that you want to study, but somehow if you're already transient on subgraphs, then in particular you transient on, on, on the big graph. Uh, if you get, get lost in Rio, then you certainly get lost in Brazil, say. Okay, and then somehow this is how this type of result goes. So, in, in the last part, I would like to, to discuss one more structural property, and this is, is the occurrence of the so-called hierarchical trees in, in as part, a uh, subgraph of these uh, infinite clusters. So we think of structures uh, which look a bit like this somehow. These clusters, you, uh, you can think of uh, these, these boxes that you can kind of put an arbitrary scale and then somehow in each box you have like a, a very strong vertex which is like very well connected to many vertices in the box. And this somehow happens in other boxes as well, not in all, but like in many. And then like many of these are connected again to like a very good vertex that is connected to a local thing here. And this you can go on at all scales. So, and we try to um, f find a way to uh, formalize this. And so we came up with a definition of what we call hierarchical, uh, hierarchical cluster trees. And here's a definition. It looks a bit 
frightening if you see it, but uh, it's not so bad actually. So let's go through it together. So first of all, QM are this QM of X are the boxes that are rooted in X, and then you just span it with uh, side length M. And then TXM is a set of trees on, on such a box QM. And somehow the vertices are endowed with weight, but it's not the original weight. Somehow it's from artificial. Yeah, you can think of that as, as height if you like. And then if M is one, then you have basically only like a single vertex. So then the single vertex is just your tray. But otherwise, you, you want to, to have a hierarchical cluster trace to, to have the following. So you want to have positive density. Somehow the vertices in your hierarchical cluster trace are really a positive proportion of the vertices in the, in the box. You know? So you don't touch anything, but somehow you really touch positive proportion. The second thing is that you are in an ultra small world in that sense that you really have boxes which connect some very small connections. Then you have ordered weights in the sense that somehow if, if you go from, from the leaf further up that somehow also these weights go up. So it gives you some order. And the final is, is a spatial uh, clustering. So that somehow says that when we have such a tree and, uh, and, and you remove an edge, so then one of the thing is really erect cluster trees, and the other thing is like a stop. I mean, something there, something is missing. But so the one, say, is a really hierarchical cluster tree, and just on a smaller scale, just on a smaller order. Uh, and it is disjoint from the rest in the sense that somehow that this one uh, really belongs, uh, is located like in, in, in a real box, and this box is completely disjoint with the rest of the cluster. So it's really uh, geographically well spread. That's what's, what's captured in this last part of the definition. So again, the, the picture that we had, and let's check the properties. So somehow positive density means really, I mean, the positive densities of vertices is taking part in the tree. Ultra small vertices, that the distances are very small. Ordered weights, again, think of that as being one, two, and three, if you like. And, but you can also jump like from one to three here, yeah, so you do not necessarily like go up always by one. And the spatial clustering somehow, let, let's, if you would remove, for example, this, this edge here, then this would be a rocky cluster tree at a smaller scale. And the rest of this, uh, this would not, uh, would be disjoint from, from the box in which this thing lives. Here's another picture in one dimension. And this, on the left hand side, you see scale free percolation in one dimension. It's, it's a simulation where the height is the actual, uh, I think it's a log of the, of the, of the, uh, of the weight, of the original weight. And on the right hand side, you see the, uh, you see this cluster, uh, hierarchical cluster tree that somehow is, is, is embedded, uh, or one, say that's embedded in such a graph. So the result about this is that indeed scale-free percolation in this parameter dream we're considering, say gamma between one and two, then uh, if you look at it in a finite, uh, on, on a finite domain, say on, on, on a box of site length M, then we, ha we have a positive, probab a positive probability there is such a hierarchical cluster tree in, in a pro with appropriate scales. And uh, so there's a quantitative lower bound uh, that this actually happens. And then there's even an infinite uh, hierarchical cluster tree. Uh, and somehow that is characterized by, say, somehow when you take this infinite tree and you remove like one edge, you, there, are, there are two pieces remaining, uh, an infinite and a final component, and the final component is is a record cluster tree. Yeah? So that's the way how we formalize this. So indeed, such things uh, exist. Yeah, so let me close with that and thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have some questions.